pleasure to welcome uh, John Carroll today to the uh, Toronto course on congenital structural heart disease. You know, John is very, very well known. He's the Director of Interventional Cardiology at um, University of Colorado at Denver, and he is one of the principal investigators of the RESPECT trial, and I want to ask him some questions about the RESPECT trial. John, uh, this is really the first major definitive trial in PFO closure. What are the results of the RESPECT trial? Where's, what's, where, what have we proven with the RESPECT trial? I think we've proven with the RESPECT and supported by the other randomized trial that for properly selected patients, 18 to 60, who have a stroke that's likely embolic in origin with no other cause other than a PFO, that PFO closure with aspirin to follow is superior to medical management options and that's really a game changer because it's a significant reduction of recurrent strokes especially if you look at a long period of time in these relatively young patients uh, over 10 plus years. Are there any special groups in that population that was studied that are worth mentioning? What were the findings with atrial septal aneurysm and patients who have significant shunts? Did they benefit more? Yes, if you look at the, the treatment benefit, and uh, it is uh, amplified by the presence of atrial septal aneurysm or uh, a um, large shunt defined on the degree of bubbles going from the right to the left atrium. Furthermore, uh, in comparison to antiplatelet therapy, it's, it's, it's clearly uh, superior to that alone. We don't know the answer with anticoagulation uh, per se. Are there any populations that are, well, what are the next steps or, or what do we need to think about? Who's not dealt with some examples of patient groups that might benefit from PFO closure who are not dealt with by the RESPECT data? Yeah. We don't know um, what the treatment effect would be in older patients where there's confounding issues of other stroke mechanisms being increasingly likely or particularly younger patients or people with overt venothromboembolic disease uh, those are some of the major groups that remain unanswered, as well as TIA. Again, we uh, studied people who had clear evidence of stroke. So you made this point uh, today that I think is an important point. When you deal with a therapy that's primarily preventive, safety is such a critical element to the procedure. I wonder if you could talk to two major categories of safety events. So one is atrial fibrillation and follow-up, and the second one is uh, venous thromboembolism and follow-up. Yes. So first of all, atrial fibrillation in all these device trials was slightly higher in the device arm than the medical arm. Still a fairly low frequency. Uh, but in respect in some of these other trials, uh, most of the AFib uh, in the device arm was transient periprocedural and did not uh, predict long-term atrial fibrillation. That's a key. Uh, secondly, in respect, we did see in this long-term study the emergence of some low frequency venothromboembolic overt disease uh, more in the device arm than the other arm. Uh, the population was somewhat enriched in that four, three to four percent had prior history of DVT, nothing active at that time. And secondly, RESPECT allowed uh, Coumadin to be one of the medical arms, and so that produced some of the asymmetry in the, in the two arms. So uh, most of the venothromboembolic uh, problems that occurred, occurred years after the procedure. So it wasn't a periprocedure DVT at the side of, of the intervention. And we think this identifies uh, some of these patients do have underlying uh, venothromboembolic disease that uh, clinicians need to be aware of if there's a history of DVT and consider perhaps PFO closure protects them from embolic stroke but not recurrent of DVTs and pulmonary emboli. I was wondering if you could comment on, you know, in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, I think it was September, October last year, there were two other studies published supportive of PFO closure. Now, what if you, if you could speak to the differences or any new information came to light? Obviously, there are different devices in one of the studies, mm -hmm. but I wonder if you could make some comments on how those other studies add to our knowledge from, that we've gained from the RESPECT trial. Yeah. Both the REDUCE and the CLOSE study in, in, uh, from uh, Professor Moss in Paris uh, were positive trials showing the superiority of PFO closure. Uh, uh, 
clothes in the antiplatelet arm uh, had the greatest treatment effect. It had zero recurrent ischemic strokes in the device arm. Um, and so that was uh, perhaps magnified by two factors. Number one, all those patients had either atrial septal aneurysm or large shunt. Um, and secondly, if you look, they're slightly younger, fewer uh, risk factors for traditional stroke mechanisms. And so it was a highly select patient population. And, and Clinicians should remember that. And Reduce also showed uh, superiority uh, using their two devices that were used in the trial. And they did add to our knowledge by doing brain imaging before and after and showed that silent infarcts do also occur. So as we know, clinical stroke is just a part of the iceberg that's out of the uh, water. And the deeper on, there, there are people suffering more paradoxical embolic issues that we should be cognizant of. You spoke to the last point that I wanted to get to today, which was, you know, rationale or starting to think about, or is there a rationale to start thinking about taking people who have high-risk lesions and doing really a primary prevention study and how that would look like, or is it even feasible to consider doing it because the event rates are low? Do you have any thoughts on, you know, you take somebody who's got a massive uh, septal aneurysm, maybe perhaps a young woman who's planning several pregnancies or is going to undergo major surgery, or can you think of a way where you might select a group of patients, you might be able to demonstrate benefit of PFO closure who haven't already had a stroke? Really a challenging issue, a challenging trial design, and people need to be aware that these are all secondary prevention studies. They weren't primary prevention, so we don't no, and certainly we have as a baseline fact that incidental PFOs are an innocent remnant of the fetal circulation in probably the majority of people, and there's something different about those people who have on, go on and have strokes, and some of it may be presence of a little eight, more than your garden variety PFO anatomy, but there are other things like uh, whether they have increased tendency to form clots, the way the flow dynamics work to increase shunting, uh, we don't know, but I think uh, to do a primary prevention uh, study, one th needs to think long-term, large numbers of patients, and try to define uh, a higher risk patient population. And maybe it is an atrial septal aneurysm is, is one of those defining factors. So I think with that, we're gonna close. I wanna thank you so much for coming to the meeting. And I, when, when you email back that you can come, I have to say we are just on cloud nine because your insight is so profound into so many different areas in, mm. in PFO closure and structural heart disease and imaging and the whole aortic valve registry in the US. It was really a pleasure having it's you. It's a great meeting, Eric. Thank, thank you, you for having me. Thanks a lot. Yeah.